Well, thank you for joining us for worship today. It's, a, it's an encouragement to be able to gather and just to be able to sing to God, to pray with one another, to, to participate in the Lord's Supper together, to hear the Word of God. Uh, today's message is the last in the Jesus is Lord series, and it's uh, titled, Jesus is Lord of All. And what good news that is when there's so many unknowns swirling all around us. Jesus, my friends, is Lord of all. Let's rest in Him. Thanks for being here today.
Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and give more than we either desire or deserve. You have reconciled us who were alienated and hostile to yourself by the death of Jesus. He presents us holy and blameless and above reproach before you through the merit of his sacrifice. We thank you for making peace by the blood of the cross. We confess that we do not love as we ought. We do not love our neighbors ourselves. We do not love you with our whole heart and mind and soul and spirit. We do not hold fast to you and we are prone to wander. Grant that we may continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that we have heard proclaimed. Open our hearts and minds that we may hear your voice and your message to us this day as you speak to us through your servant. Grant that we, though scattered in location, may worship you with one accord in spirit and in truth. Pour down upon us the abundance of your many blessings, forgiving us those things whereof our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy of, but you provide through the merit and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Well, this morning, we want to invite you to sing with us. Ephesians 1 reminds us, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Now let's turn our hearts and our eyes toward him this morning as we worship together. Today in 
response of reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 8. I'll start us out. and You guys will follow the prompts. It starts out like this. There is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, and you say, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And we all say together, And, and there, there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, Christ through, through whom all things came and through whom we live.
really glad that you joined us for worship this morning, and I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on where we are as a church with our reopening plans. Um, I really have appreciated your encouragement and your support over these seven months since we've been able to meet together in person here in the sanctuary, and I would expect that going forward, this is probably how most of us are going to worship on Sunday mornings. But we are going to be, starting next week, able to have uh, at least one service of about 65 people here in the sanctuary. That will start at 10.15 a.m. And at the same time, at 10.15, starting next Sunday, we'll have K to 5th grade uh, Grace Kids programming outside on the lawn. We're doing it that way in order to give kids a chance to hear the gospel in our community, to learn more about God, and to learn more about the Bible. Um, that said, between the 8.30 outdoor service and the 10.15 indoor service, we're only going to have room for about 30% of our pre-COVID worship attendance. Based on some surveys I've seen for pastors, that's about what other churches are experiencing in terms of return rate. So if you're not comfortable coming back yet, or you're not expecting to come back for a while, maybe until there's a vaccine or even later, don't worry, you're in good company. Probably most of our church will continue to worship online like this. But if you would like to join us uh, starting this week, either indoors at 1015 or outdoors at 830, we'd love to have you register online ahead of time so that there's enough room for everyone who comes. If it turns out after a few weeks we have way more people who want to be present than those 130 spots that we have set up right now, we'll consider adding additional services. Um, I'm here all day Sunday. I'll just keep talking uh, for as many services as people want to come and participate for. Um, so that's where we are in reopening stuff. I know it's not the most important thing going on in the world right now, uh, but we do want to create an opportunity for us to worship God together and for you to continue to grow in your faith and for us to reach our community well. So would you pray with me for that? Let's pray. God, I am so grateful for uh, those in our church family um, who have sought to be an encouragement and a help to others, to their neighbor, to their families during this challenging season. God, I pray that uh, our times of worship, whether they're online or in person, would be an encouragement in their faith, would help them be strengthened for the works of ministry you have for them, and would uh, sustain them in the work that you've called them to. God, we pray for all the uh, challenges that our world is facing this week. God, we pray especially this morning for the president and the first lady and others in the presidential administration who have tested positive for COVID. Um, God, we know that their lives are in your hands, even as our lives are in your hands. And God, we pray that, uh, as your word instructs us, we pray for those in high positions that life would go well for them so that they would be a blessing to all in the nation and in the world. God, we pray for um, all the pressing needs that are in our congregation this week, for those who are sick, for those who are discouraged, uh, for those who are struggling. We pray that you would lift them up with the strength of your arms. And God, we pray for our world. Um, God, may we be people that announce the kingdom of God in our words, in our deeds, and in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we open our ears and hearts to God's word, would you pray this prayer along with me? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Help us now to hear and obey what you say to us today. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, Grace. Our scripture this morning is from Colossians 1, 15 to 23. It reads, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. 
the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, Savior of the world, Son of God, divine ruler, the news of his birth and his rule was called the gospel. His fame was spread throughout the known world by special messengers. The preachers of his gospel believed he had brought a reign of peace to the whole world and that he had all authority in heaven and on earth. Who is this man? Well, if you were to visit a church today like ours and ask people to whom these titles and sayings refer, you would probably hear Jesus Christ, of course. And they'd be right. The Bible says that Jesus is Lord, Savior of the world, Son of God. But let's say you're visiting uh, cities and towns in the first century under the rule of the Roman Empire. If you were to enter a town and ask people who do these titles and slogans, these sayings refer to, they would answer differently. Lord, Savior of the world, Son of God, of course you must be talking about Caesar. In the first century, each of these titles described the Roman emperors, powerful men, who ruled the world with an iron fist, demanding submission to the ever-expanding empire. This background helps us understand the, the explosive nature of the phrase, Jesus is Lord, when the early Christians uttered that. It wasn't just saying, you have your Lord, Caesar. We have our Lord, Jesus. Let's agree to disagree. No, that's not the way it worked. The way it worked and the way it still works is that there can only be one Lord. So when the Christians said, Jesus is Lord, they were at the same time saying, and Caesar is not. There was no getting around this. What did that spell for the early Christians? Trouble. You can't have two Lords. The Romans knew that and so did the Christians. One and only one must be Lord of all. Now, it's a Christian virtue, I think, a peaceable posture in many cases to adopt a both and attitude with what we believe as Christians. To not be too narrow, to be generous with our views, because after all, we could be wrong. We're fallible. But when it comes to Jesus being Lord, be narrow. Be unbending. Hold fast to that confession and don't let go. Now, please be kind and gracious to others who would disagree. There's no excuse not to be. Be a Christian. But there's no wiggle room when it comes to identifying the one Savior, the one Lord. It is Jesus and there is no other. Today, we bring our series, Jesus is Lord, to a close And to sum up all that we've been seeing in the Gospels over the past few weeks, we'll go outside of the Gospels to hear what the Apostle Paul has to say. And I think this is helpful for a couple reasons. One, Paul was lost but now is found. He once was an enemy of Jesus, a persecutor of the church. Now he's a champion of Christ, a defender of God's people. So to hear these words that we'll hear today from him, ought to warm our hearts and give us hope that God's power can change anyone's life 
And another reason it's good to hear from Paul as we wrap up this series is that the gospel writers are in the story of Jesus. They're reporting on events that took place in Jerusalem or at the temple, which is incredible and great. But Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, he pulls the lens way back and gives us a big, big picture of the lordship of Jesus Christ. And what's his conclusion? Jesus is Lord of all. Listen to Colossians 1, 15 to 20 again. And this time, keep in mind the prevailing view, the view that was enforced by the powers that no one is greater than Caesar. Caesar is Lord. Are you ready? Ready to hear Paul's words about Jesus and all their subversive glory? Colossians 1.15 He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. Verse 17 And He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. We'll read some more of that because it's just so good. A couple times through isn't enough. But this word, these these words that the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Spirit, wrote and sent to the church at Colossae, incredible, this portrait of Christ. And it's exactly what got the Christians in hot water, believing this. Because they weren't just saying, we believe Jesus is Lord and hope a lot of other people will too. But rather, because Jesus is Lord, No one else can be. Not even you, your majesty, Caesar. You too must bow down before the true Lord. Jesus is Lord. Lord of what? All? Everything? In Paul's uh, Christological rant, he can't say enough about Jesus, who is Lord of creation, verses 15 to 17. Jesus, who is Lord of redemption, verses 18 to 20. Jesus, who is Lord of all who continue in the faith, verses 21 to 23. This whole passage in Colossians 1 takes about one minute to read. But if you believe it, it will change your life. Not for a moment, not for a minute, but forever. This word is transformative. It, it's, it's radical. And when it came to the Colossians, it was just what they needed to hear. Remember, when Paul writes to them, they're dominated by a foreign power. They're living in, in their land, but under the control of others, the control of the Roman Empire. And do you know how empires control people? They monopolize political structures by pushing people around with military might, by keeping a tight grip on all the necessary resources, and by flooding you with propaganda, like posting Caesar's image everywhere there was a flat surface, which is what they did. But even after all that, there's always one thing that the oppressor knows they need to control if they're truly going to subjugate a people. One thing that if you don't have this, you lose. Do you know what that is? The imagination where hope resides. Why could enslaved people in America sing of freedom and hope even while they were enslaved and saw no change on the horizon? Because their imaginations were free. How could Israel's prophets, even while they were captive in a foreign land, still look forward to the the homecoming, 
the restoration to their land, free food and a day when all that is wrong would be made right. Because even though their bodies were captive, their imaginations were free. They were fixed on the promises of God, free to dream, free to hope. Paul knows that if he can shape the imagination of the Christians at Colossae with the truth about Jesus, then they'll be all right. So he proclaims a message that's intended to empower the community to live in a truth that is at times very hard to see, the truth that Jesus is is Lord of all. He starts at a good place to start with creation. Jesus is Lord of creation. Look again at verse 15. He is the image, not Caesar, whose image is everywhere, but Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus, Paul says, is the maker of all. Every part of creation was created by him and for him. He is supreme in creation. He is not part of creation. He is the creator of creation. Now that phrase at the end of verse 15, firstborn of creation... That's been misunderstood by some to mean that Christ was created. And to be fair, that's what the words sound like. We usually associate the term firstborn with birth and and with birth order, right? Firstborn. Like Luke 2, 7, Jesus is called the firstborn son of Mary. And in that example, Jesus literally was the first one born to Mary. But this word firstborn has another sense that has to do with status. Psalm 89, 27, for instance, there we hear God referring to David say, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Now, if you remember, David was the last born of his brothers, the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. So firstborn there is not a comment on the creation of David. It's a comment on the status of David, his preeminence among the king's of the earth. In the same way, Paul's not talking about the creation of Jesus. He's talking about the elevation of Jesus, the preeminence, the supremacy of Jesus, the firstborn. Jesus was not created. He has always been. He is eternal. Like the Nicene Creed of the fourth century says, he was eternally begotten of the Father, And in case our minds, that's really strange. How is someone eternally begotten? What does that mean? Well, just to be super clear, the creed goes on and says this, helpful. Begotten, not made. Not made. He's always been. Paul goes on and in verse 16 tells us that all things were created by him, through him, for him. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things, he says, Uh, we would think that covers it, right? All things were created by him, through him, for him. But in case anyone's skilled at finding loopholes, Paul qualifies what he means when he says things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. What's left? Nothing. John 1, 3 says, all things were made through him, that is Jesus, And without him was not anything made that was made. Included in this all things are thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. The the visible ones, the visible thrones and rulers in the Roman Empire, the human powers, and the invisible ones, the spiritual forces in the heavenlies. Christ made them all, and as such, Christ has authority over them all. And if that's not enough to convince us that Jesus is Lord over creation, Paul adds verse 17, and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus keeps the cosmos from becoming chaos. He holds all things together. Some Jews believe that the whole cosmos would fly apart if it weren't for the the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. 
They thought that that festival maintained the harmony of the upper world and the lower world. But what Paul says, it's, it's not a festival that keeps things from flying apart. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord of creation. So Paul starts with a cosmic Christ standing above all of creation, so powerful, so sovereign, so great, but he doesn't stop there. After all, creation is fallen and and not what God intended it to be. It's not enough that Jesus is Lord of creation. If there's any hope for us, any hope for anyone he's made, he must also be Lord of redemption. Good news, he is. Jesus is Lord of redemption. Look at verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. In verse 18, the emphasis shifts from Jesus being uh, Lord of creation to now being Lord of redemption with the phrase, he is the head of the body, the church. See, the Colossians' physical bodies, they were residents in the Roman Empire. But nonetheless, as his body, the church, they belong to Christ. Paul just keeps poking Herod in the eye, poking him in the eye. Jesus is head. Jesus is ruler of his people. Not you, buddy. In verse 18 and then in 19 and again in verse 20, we get three reasons that Jesus is Lord of redemption. Reasons he's worthy to be head of the body. First, he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. We see that in verse 18. Like before, firstborn here means preeminent or supreme. We might ask, what does firstborn from the dead mean? Well, it can't mean that he was the first one to come back from the dead, right? Not if we're reading our Bible in in chronological order. In the Old Testament, under the ministries of Elijah, Elijah and Elisha, people were raised from the dead. When we get to Luke 7, a widow's son at Nain, Jesus raises her dead son from the dead. And perhaps the most well-known, formerly dead, now alive person that comes to mind is Lazarus. Paul isn't saying Jesus was the first to come to life from the dead. He's saying that he is supreme in this, preeminent. That he's the one at the head of the resurrection parade. All others who are raised from the dead, guess what? They would all die again. Lazarus came out of the grave still wearing his grave clothes. He would need them again. But Jesus left his clothes in the tomb. Jesus is alive, never to die. Jesus Christ was raised over 2,000 years ago. He is still alive to this day. He is the preeminent one who rules over creation And by his resurrection, he rules over new creation as well. A second reason Jesus is fit to be called the head of the body, the supreme ruler, is that he's the fullness of God. Look at verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Jesus, he's not an exalted angel. Jesus is not an incredibly godlike guru, a really wise sage, the best teacher of all teachers. He's the fullness of God. And just to make sure we get it, Paul says in in a chapter later, Colossians 2, 9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The whole fullness of deity dwells in the person of Jesus So God, he used to make his dwelling in places, a temple, a tabernacle, this mountain, that mountain. But now God's fullness is located in a person, in Jesus. All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. A third reason given to support Jesus as the rightful head of his body 
He's the one who reconciles all creation through his death. One author writes, Just as our minds have soared to the lofty heights of preeminence and fullness, we're quickly brought down to the depths of human pain and suffering. And that happens when we encounter the phrase, by the blood of his cross, verse 20. So blood and cross, that's violence, that's death, that's shame. Jesus bore this for us. Because of sin, we all have needs. We need resurrection from the dead because we all die. We need reconciliation because we're separated from God and each other. We need peace because we're born natural enemies of God and neighbor. We need the blood of Jesus' cross because that's our only way home. So Jesus is Lord of creation, and by virtue of his cross, he's Lord of redemption too. That's what we see in verses 15 to 20, this, this incredible, glorious passage about the person of Jesus. But notice Paul doesn't conclude this praise to Jesus by saying something uh, vague and general like, isn't this great for everyone who might believe it, hopefully, someday? No, he makes it personal, and he speaks of the effect the gospel has had at Colossae. Real Christians, real people in a town that were converted to Christ. Christ is the image of the invisible God for you, Colossians. That's what he says to them. He's the firstborn from the dead for you, Colossians. He created you, and when sin wrecked things, he recreated you by the blood of his cross. That's how much he cares for you. In verses 21 to 23, Paul reminds them that the blood of Jesus spilled in Jerusalem has made its way all the way to Colossae. See, Paul knows the pressure that they face. He knows the challenges of living for Jesus in a a crooked and perverse generation. The persecution without, the temptations within. And with the words of Christ's supremacy, his lordship of creation, his lordship of, of redemption still ringing in their ears, he speaks very personally to them of their, their past, their present, their future. He says, you once were, you now are, you will be if. He says, you once were alienated, hostile, caught up in evil deeds, verse 21. And then he says, but because you now are reconciled by his cross, you're holy and blameless and above reproach, verse 22. And you'll stay that way, what? If you continue in the faith, Verse 23, Jesus is Lord of all who continue in the faith. When Paul says, if indeed you continue in the faith, he's highlighting the effort that will be present in the life of a believer, not the earning of salvation. He's really clear on that. We don't earn anything. Nothing in my hand I bring. It's all of grace. But the spirit enable effort in working out our salvation, in the wrestling that the Christian does in this life, the walking, the pressing on, the falling forward that is part of a transformed person's experience. See, believing in Jesus is the beginning, not the end of our commitment to Him. Believing in Jesus is the beginning, not the end of our commitment to him. So we start in the faith when we first believe, but then there's a need to continue in the faith. It's like Jesus says in Matthew 24, he who endures to the end will be saved. How do you do that? How do you endure? How do you continue in the faith? With others. We gather together in local churches, whether at home during this time, on, on your screen or in person, not because we want to add something else to our busy lives, but because our lives depend on it, literally. We will fall and fail 
and flounder if we don't support one another. If we are to continue in the faith, as Paul says, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, then we must pursue Jesus. And we must pursue him together. We can't do it alone. I think Bob's uh, hymn reference last week influenced me. Uh, and this past week, my hope is built on nothing less has been rolling around in my head. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Maybe you know the next line. I can hear you. I can hear you in my imagination. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And maybe just to emphasize that, the hymn writer says it again. All other ground is sinking sand. Who's getting the bulk of your trust today? Is it Jesus? All other ground, friends, whether a vaccine for COVID, a cure for cancer, a political candidate, or a social justice organization, if we're looking to them or to ourselves to save us, to heal us, to deliver us, to restore us, to bring us peace, then we will be disappointed. Why? Because all these other grounds are sinking sand. Only Jesus provides a stable place for our feet. So plant yours on him. May God help us all to wholly lean on Jesus. Amen? Let's pray together. God, I, it's hard to even know what to pray some days, but I think we're safe to say, would you take what's true in what we've heard and form us with it? Would, would you do your great work with your word that goes out? Would you save the lost that they might put their full weight on Jesus for salvation? They might trust him, not themselves. They might have all their sins forgiven and new life granted. Would you rebuke us in our sin, your people? Because as a father disciplines the children they love, you discipline us. Would you lift us up if we're despairing? Would you give us hope? Would you bring light into our darkness? Would you bring joy to us instead of the sadness that we, we might so easily uh, fall into and, and feel like we can't get out of this funk? Would you show us the path, God, that leads to life and keep us on it? And Lord, please, please, please don't let any of us hearing this today think that we can do this even for a minute on our own. You have resourced us with the church, your word, the Holy Spirit. But there is something about fellowship, pursuing together that we have to have in our life or we will fail. Would you bind us together? Would you give us uh, creative ideas about how to stay connected when we still might not feel comfortable leaving the house? Would you mature us as your people and use this church, God, to continue to hold out a Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. In his name we pray, amen. invite you to respond and worship with us through communion and invite you to gather up your communion items now and we'll join together and take communion in a moment we want to teach you this new song today as we center our hearts and our eyes our vision on jesus together 
goes like this. Oh, Christ, be the center of our lives. Be the place we fix our eyes. Be the center of our lives. Let's try that together. Oh, Christ, be the center of our lives. Be the place we fix our eyes. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table, let's silently confess our sins to our wonderful, merciful God who wants to hear what we have to say. Well, having offered up our confession, we now come together as one body to the table where Jesus has offered up himself, his body, and his blood for us. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. As often as you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. And so I'd encourage you to take your bread at home, raise it up, the body of Christ given for you. Let's eat together. The Apostle Paul goes on and says that in the same way after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Please grab your cup, the blood of Christ spilled for you. Let's drink together. Paul ends this section by saying, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he is coming again. And our prayer is, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you stretched out your arms of love upon the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. Let's continue to sing this new song together, declaring Jesus the center of the universe, the one who holds all things together. Join with us. For you're the center of the universe, everything that's made in you. Everything 
Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. We hope that in addition to these worship services, you get a chance to be connected with our church family. And so if you're new to Grace, maybe you've been watching online with someone that you know or someone invited you or you've just been sort of checking this church out, we'd love to get to know you. On the side in the description, uh, we'd, there's a chance for you to email us or just let us know in the comments that you're new. Um, myself or one of the other pastors would love to uh, connect with you and hear your story and what brought you to Grace. Also, we'd love for you to consider joining a group, whether you're new to Grace or you've been here a long time. If you go to gracesillbeach.org, you'll see an opportunity to join any number of groups, some that are meeting online and, and some that are meeting in person, and we'd love for you to consider being part of one of those. Um, one group that is starting, a two-week group, is going to be on citizenship and in light of a political, the political realities that we live in. Uh, pastor Don, who is one of our former senior pastors and is retired now as our pastor emeritus, uh, he's going to be leading a two-Sunday night group coming up the next two weeks on Christian citizenship and what are our responsibilities and what does the Bible say about what it means to be a Christian citizen. Don's a really thoughtful guy, and this isn't going to be a partisan uh, haranguing for one side or the other, but rather a thoughtful discussion of what Scripture says for us as Christian citizens. So we'd love for you to consider learning from Pastor Don on that. Also, I wanted to mention a family in our church that is moving to Nevada who has been a really key part of our church for a long time that we're going to miss a lot. Uh, Ken and Gina Kornstrom have been here for a couple decades together with their kids, uh, Sean and Ryan, and Gina has been on our church staff in our finance department for about 17 years, and Ken's been an elder at our church in the past. Uh, we're going to really miss them a lot, and so if you know Ken and Gina, I'd encourage you to reach out to them and 
show them how much you care about them and how much we're going to miss them as a church as they spend their retirement years uh, building a new house in Nevada. So Ken and Gina, we love you. We're going to miss you guys and look forward to, to Sean and Ryan's weddings coming up soon. Our benediction this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and ever. Amen.